Hello, welcome to this Brit Lit 10 video podcast on Beowulf. Today, lesson three, the language of the Beowulf poem. Before we begin, I ask that you give the material the time and the attention that it deserves. I reserve the right to give you a pop quiz on any homework assignment, including this video podcast. You may also be held responsible for this material on more substantial assessments, such as projects, tests, and exams. Please resist the temptation to multitask and close all other programs on your computer except for those that you might use for note-taking. Additionally, please have your copy of Beowulf with you. You will need to refer to it while watching this video. As you watch and listen, take notes, stopping and replaying the video as necessary. Be prepared to apply what you've learned in this video to your understanding of the poem. Finally, today's lesson is divided into three parts. What the Anglo-Saxon language looked like, what the Anglo-Saxon language sounded like, and the role of language in the Beowulf poem. Let's begin. You will recall that in the last video podcast, we considered how a lecture by J.R.R. Tolkien and the discovery of the burial ship at Sutton Hoo shaped the way in which we look at the Beowulf poem today, that today we look at it as a work of art. So if we're going to consider Beowulf as a work of art, then we have to look at the language of the poem itself we have to ask ourselves a few fundamental questions about that language. And the first of those questions is simply this. What did Anglo-Saxon look like? Now to begin to answer that question, I'm going to give you a little taste of paleography, which is the study of ancient handwriting. What I'd like for you to do now is to open up your Beowulf book to pages 2 and 3. If you look at page 3, you will find that the words there make sense to you, even if you don't know what the poem is about or what's happening at that given moment in the story. And that's because that side of the book is written in modern English, the version of English that you and I speak, the language that English-speaking people have been speaking since the 16th century. But if you look at the text on page 2, you will see that it is much more difficult, if not impossible, to read. And that's because it's written in the poem's original language, Anglo-Saxon, the version of English that people spoke from the 5th century until about the 12th century. What comes between Anglo-Saxon and Modern English is a language called Middle English, which we will learn about a bit sometime in September. At any rate, your edition of Beowulf is set up this way from the beginning to the end, with the original Anglo-Saxon on the even-numbered pages and the Modern English translation on the odd-numbered pages. And while we are going to read the poem in Modern English, we will read with greater appreciation and deeper understanding if we spend at least a little time with its original language, Anglo-Saxon. Now you will recall that Anglo-Saxon culture was an oral culture. In fact, all Germanic cultures were oral cultures. But that doesn't mean that they didn't have alphabets. They did, even if they didn't use them very much. The umbrella term for these Germanic alphabets is runes, R-U-N-E-S. Now if you look at the screen, you will notice that the letters in this sample runic alphabet employ a lot of straight lines. Perfect if you're carving the words into wood or stone. These were very rudimentary alphabets, but they worked for the Germanic tribes since they didn't need to use them all that much. Now, the Anglo-Saxons had their own runic alphabet, which they called Futhork, named after the first six letters of the alphabet. The third of those letters is called Thorn, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Now, the Anglo-Saxons developed Futhork shortly after they arrived on the island of Britannia sometime in the 5th century. But by the 8th century, as they became increasingly Christianized, the Anglo-Saxons began to slowly adopt the missionary's Latin alphabet, the alphabet of the church, and the alphabet that you and I use today. By the time that the monks transcribed Beowulf in the late 10th or early 11th century, only a few Futhork letters were still in use. On your screen is a photo of the first few lines of the Beowulf manuscript, the same lines that are at the top of page 2 in your book. Let's look at the word in the middle of the first line. The first letter of that word looks like a P, but it is called win, and it makes a W sound. The word of which it is a part is the word way, which means we in modern English. Now look at the second line, just to the right of win. You see a letter that also looks a little bit like a P, but its stem goes as high up as the tail goes down. That letter is thorn which makes a th sound. The word of which it is a part is third, which is a noun that means nation or tribe. 
Finally, look at the third line, again toward the middle. You'll see what appears to be a four-letter word whose third letter looks like a lowercase d with a slash through the stem. That's the letter F, and like thorn, it makes a th sound. The word that seems to be made of four letters is actually two words made of two letters each. The second of those two words is the, which means then. The word that precedes it is who, which means how. Taken together, they mean how then. Win, thorn, eth. These are the last holdovers from the Anglo-Saxon alphabet known as Futhork, and they are regular features of the Beowulf poem as it appears in your book. So, if that's what Anglo-Saxon looks like, what did it sound like? For obvious reasons, there are very few recordings of actual Anglo-Saxon speaking. But that doesn't mean that scholars haven't been able to reconstruct the language as it probably sounded when it was spoken over a thousand years ago. Not surprisingly, it sounds an awful lot like German. So let's take a look at a fairly well-known Christian prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's common enough that even those who aren't Christian have probably heard of it. This is how it goes in modern English, the language that you and I speak. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Now let's take a look at the same prayer as it was spoken by the Anglo-Saxons as they converted to Christianity in the second half of the first millennium. The first thing that you will notice is that there are plenty of examples of thorn, one of the holdover letters that you just learned about. It also has a few examples of eth as well. And this is how the Lord's Prayer sounds in Anglo-Saxon. Father Ura, thu de erton hefonum, si di nami yet hagud. Tho bicum in thirishe, ye wither thin willa, on earthen swa swa on hefonum. Un ye die while licum laugh si lecus to dieh, and for ye was yura yiltus, swa swa we for ye with yura mildendum. Ene ye lea to us on cus nungung, acalius uf yuvila, sot licha. If you look carefully, you will see that there are a number of words that you can recognize. Father Ura, for example, which are the first two words in the first line, is clearly recognizable as Our Father. In class, we'll see how many others you can recognize, but for now, let's just leave off with the acknowledgement that this is the language that the Anglo-Saxons spoke, the earliest version of the language that you and I speak today. We're going to move on now to the third part of today's lesson, the role of language in the Beowulf poem. Here are the four terms that you will learn about today. Rhetoric, formal boasting, flighting, and litotes. Let's take a look at the first of these terms. Rhetoric is the art of persuasion through the use of language. In it, the speaker or the writer attempts to get the audience to think, to feel, or to act in a certain way. Rhetoric is all about the power of language, something that the Anglo-Saxons certainly understood. But rhetoric is also a part of our everyday lives. You hear it when a politician is telling his audience exactly what he thinks that they want to hear, whether it's true or not. You hear it in television advertisements, and you read it on the op-ed pages of the newspaper or in the comments section of your favorite blog on the internet. And you may hear it from yourself when you try to convince that girl to go out with you or when you try to persuade your parents that it's a good idea to let you go to that party on Saturday night. In its simplest form, rhetoric can be reduced to three elements. The speaker, the purpose, the speaker's goal, and the audience, the person or the group that the speaker wants to persuade. Throughout the year, we will examine the power of language through the lens of rhetoric. 
And the reason that we will look at the use of rhetoric in Beowulf is precisely because, as we saw in Lesson 2, the mastery of language was an important Anglo-Saxon cultural value. What makes Beowulf heroic is that he is able to wield his words as effectively as he wields his sword. His verbal superiority and his physical superiority go hand in hand. Now you will recall that when Anglo-Saxon warriors weren't on the battlefield, they spent their time in the meat hall, where they would drink and play games and generally hang out together. And as anyone who's ever hung out with men knows, the one thing that they like to talk about is themselves, to boast or to brag. Anglo-Saxon men were no different, but for them bragging was a ritualized event, one in which each man would try to assert his superiority by letting the others know just how awesome he was. Such formal boasts usually included references to one's ancestry, one's heroic qualities, past accomplishments, current intentions, and the promise of future success. Formal boasting is a rhetorical claim of one man's dominance over the others. A term closely related to formal boasting is flighting. A regular part of life in the meat hall, flighting was a highly competitive, ritualized form of verbal fighting that consisted of a series of insults and boasts. It was both entertaining and deadly serious. Words were used as weapons with which to attack and as shields with which to defend against one's enemies, and one's reputation as a warrior could rise or fall depending on the outcome of a given battle. As such, flighting was yet another Anglo-Saxon testament to the power of language. Because they were ritualized, formal boasting and flighting were obvious shows of power on the part of the speaker. But within all that bluster, it was sometimes possible to find some subtlety. One less obvious rhetorical strategy was a figure of speech called litotes, which means plain or simple in Greek. Litotes uses a negative term to make a positive claim. It depends on ironic understatement to make its point. As a form of rhetoric, Latotes allows the speaker to de-emphasize the very thing that he or she thinks is important. It gives a false sense of impartiality, which allows the speaker to make the point that much more convincing. Here are a few Latotes that you might have heard in the course of your daily life. On the left, what the speaker says. On the right, what the speaker means. Note that in each example on the left, the speaker is using a negative term to make a positive claim. There are lots of different types of litotes for different types of situations. Litotes often depend on a certain tone to work, which makes them hard to spot when you are reading. In Beowulf, though, they are almost always used in the context of flighting or boasting, which makes them a bit easier to spot. Beowulf uses them to brag under the guise of false humility. It's what we might today recognize as a humble brag. Like LeBron in the picture, he's letting everyone know how awesome he is, but he's doing it in a seemingly modest and self-deprecating way. That concludes this BritLit 10 video podcast on the language of the Beowulf poem. In our next podcast, we'll look at some of the literary devices used in the Beowulf poem. See you then.